welcome everyone and thank you for joining us for our Greener Clay talk. Um, my name's Annette Welch um, and I'm the Programme Manager for Ceramics Department at Morley College. I'm joined by four people, Susan Lindsay, Arabella Finch, Yoko von Bank and Deborah Marrick. They all come to, they all attend the Friday morning class, which is an advanced ceramics class at Morley. Um, and they've generously offered their time to put together this talk. So the format of the talk, um, I'm going to do a brief introduction um, and then each contributor is going to talk using visuals about different approaches to making or processing ceramics in a more considered or sustainable way with reference to a particular make maker or a type of practice after which we're going to have a short time to ask some, one another some questions um, about the topics. Lovely, thank you. Um, as an introduction to our discussion on sustainability, um, I'd first like to reflect on the notion that clay is a fundamental part of our lives. It's always been there and is key to our understanding of human existence. In this slide, you can see um, some bottles they are, that archaeologists discovered in children's graves in Bavaria. They're from the Bronze Age and they're around two and a half to three and a half thousand years old. Researchers have recently discovered that the residue contained in the bottles was from dairy products, most likely milk from cows or goats, and therefore concluded from that that they must have been bottles, bottle feeders for children a sort of Bronze Age sippy cup. Um, I find these bottles astonishing, actually. Um, not only are they functional, but they're beautiful, they're playful and tender as well. I think they've been made with love and thought. And to me, they represent the longevity of clay and how fundal it, fundamental it is to society. Clay survives. And therefore, objects made out of it teaches us about past civilizations, how people lived, what they ate and drank, their beliefs, and also that humans have always had this inherent need to create and to decorate. Um, can I have the next slide, please? Okay, to the to the talk today. Then this is um, called Greener Clay: um, Thoughts on a More Sustainable Approach to Ceramics. Um, in these two images, we've got a, a Bronze Age cup, tiny little cup there, that was fired in a hearth. And then on the right, we've got cups made from clay, that, which I dug up from our local allotments in Nunhead. Just to sort of show how clay can be found very easily. However, the ceramics industry can be viewed as somewhat questionable in terms of sustainability. For example, there's the mining and use of toxic and rare minerals, carbon heavy kiln firings, and the use of non-renewable virgin materials. These are all practices that make it ripe for criticism. Uh, next slide, please. Um, as you can see here, the image on the left, uh, which is called Clay Mountains, um, and they're, they're mountains that have been made from waste material for mining for um, china clay in Cornwall. Um, and china clay was mined to make English porcelain. And then on the right, we've got the Eden project. And that's actually been built. I mean, the scale of the Eden project is large. And this has been built on top of the, the site of an old clay pit. So currently, there's a drive to explore greener and more sustainable ways of working in ceramics, particularly in small-scale workshops and within individual studio practices. Makers and designers are developing a range of creative and scientific approaches from utilising ceramic waste, using local materials and clays, and limiting the use of virgin material through re recycling. So we're now going to have a look at some of these innovations. Um, so I'm going to hand over to Sue now. Thank you. Thanks, Annette. Um, I'm going to look at uh, 
two things, really. I'm going to look at a ceramics recycling initiative in Liverpool and also um, some techniques for reusing ceramics and mending ceramics. So first of all, the recycling project. And what we have on this slide, um, it's about, this is about the Turner Prize in 2015, which was won by a collective of architects and designers called Assemble. They had worked on an area in Liverpool called Granby, where in 2011, some local residents set up a community land trust. And the local people had taken over 10 empty houses and they asked Assemble to help renovate them. So there were many projects involved in this exercise, but one of them was a ceramics recycling project. And what they did was they took rubble from the empty houses, uh, all done at a craft type scale, and they recycled uh, that material into objects such as tiles and fireplaces and door handles, and then reinstated them in the renovated homes. If we go to slide two, next slide, please, Emily. Um, so these experimental cer ceramicists, now called Granby Workshops, they're still based in Granby, and they're led by someone called Lewis Jones, who is one of the members of Assemble. To date, they've manufactured a range of architectural ceramic objects, such as recycled tiles, um, light pendants, using all recycled materials. But what they're doing now is taking it to a different level. And having used Kickstarter to raise funds, they are on the cusp of distributing their first batch of mass-produced tableware. And they've called it Grambyware. And their aim is to make this tableware from 100% recycled materials. So if we look at the next slide, please, what they have done um, is using their craft-based approach, they have experimented and experimented with a, a range of materials of sludges and silts and debris to work out how to make a sufficiently consistent clay body and sufficiently consistent glaze from the waste streams, this variety of waste streams that they buy in. And on this slide, we can see um, some of these things. So crushed glass, which goes into the glazes, uh, quarry waste, various sorts of quarrying material, quarry materials, burnt bricks, uh, they're, they're called ref refractory bricks. So burnt bricks from demolished furnaces and kilns and broken up ceramics such as tiles and plates, fired ceramic waste. So having done all this experimentation at the craft scale, they've reached a point that they can step up using an industrial scale manufacturing technique to make their tableware. And if we look at the next slide, this is the range of tableware they're producing. It's, it isn't cheap. Um, the current project on Kickstarter, which is their first one, they ask people to put in money to secure, say, a plate. And they're asking for, I think it was £25 for a large plate. So it's quite an expensive exercise at the moment. One of the things that pushes the cost up is they have this key challenge of ensuring consistency. Uh, because as they mix up each batch of clay... Um, they have to test it, test it to ensure that the composition is right and add whatever is, is needed to get to that consistency. So they've, in effect, had to add a whole new um, step. So they're making their own clay body and then they're testing it. Um, but what they are doing is, unlike a lot of large scale production, they are not refining out um, the fact that it is recycled. So that you can see the glazes are still speckled um, because of impurities in them. So it's still, 
is evidently, self-evidently, a, a recycled product. The benefit of doing it, um, despite the cost, is, is that they are avoiding extracting more virgin material. Um, and extracting clay produces waste. Um, the collective say that to produce one tonne of um, China clay, they have to produce, one has to produce nine tonnes of waste. So the avoidance of that is, is very high up their object, list of objectives. Uh, I'm gonna look at another technique, which is to do with mending ceramics. So if we look at the next slide, uh, a picture from the Granby site there, we see they've broken up their ceramics and they grind them down to make their clay body. On the right, we see a bowl um, that has been reassembled, a kintsugi bowl, using the Japanese art of kintsugi, which developed from an ancient technique of mending ceramics with tree lacquer. Uh, tree lacquer is resin. Um, from a you know tree sap and that's been going on for a very long time but in about the 19th century in Japan they started decorating these repairs with gold which elevated the technique to much more of a creation of a, a unique object a valued object in, it, in its own right um, and there are an awful lot of them and some academics believe it became quite a fashionable thing um, either that or there were a lot of tea bowls being broken if we look at the next slide, there's another on the right there, another old uh, kintsugi bowl, a, a 17th century bowl that's in the Smithsonian. And on the left, an example of kintsugi being used in modern ceramic um, art. And this is a plate that has been, was made to commemorate the nuclear uh, power station disaster in Japan, in, in Fukushima, by... Paul Scott. So it's a technique that has endured. Um, on my last slide, um, please, Emily, is rather more mundane. Um, this is a pot in my garden that suffered in the snow earlier this year and basically fell apart because of frost damage. And it's 30 years old, and I thought I will have a go at putting it back together again. Um, and it is, it is possible. I've used that product you see on the right, Milliput, which is a two-part epoxy resin. And I have stuck it back together again. And it is at the moment hanging on in there. And I'm hoping it continues to do so uh, for another few years. Um, I'm going to pass over now to Arabella, who I'm sure is going to tell us about something much more refined than um, what I find at the end of my garden. Thanks, Sue. Okay. Um, yeah, I don't know about refined, but completely different. Um, and we were to, if we're talking today about the kind of use, the use of materials, something I do in my own practice is reuse materials over and over again. Um, I I have a fine art background, um, even though I've been attending uh, an et ceramics course at Morley for many years. Um, and when I started off in this art malarkey, I was a painter. And then I ended up being an installation artist where I use and still use a combination of different media um, to produce um, um, a, a kinds of works which are which are uh, might contain might be contained in a whole room. They might be stuck on the wall. They might be put on the floor, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and something I I use I use porcelain at Morley. Um, I have used bits of old porcelain and and revived it by wetting it and soaking it. Um, I've used wood. I've used. I do use masking tape. And every time I use something, um, it's it's from the previous pro project. Um, and so, as we could describe that as a type of recycling. Um, anyway, um, what we have here is. Uh, Another artist called Rebecca Warren, um, and she is somebody who uses unfired clay in her work. Again, she uses lots of different sorts of media. Um, and this is uh, um, from 2003, and she makes 
very very large scale work and they they are they resemble the female form as you can see um but they are heavily distorted and the way she uses unrefined clay um is it she sort of uses it in unrefined manner as well um um so she has it she uses it on a very large scale um but if you see the next slide there's some other artists um, called Fishley and Weiss. Um, they also use unfired clay. Um, and this, these um, little pieces, you can see this is at the Guggenheim, um, but it's been all over the world, um, um, where each, on the top of each plinth, you have a little, little tiny um, seam, I suppose, and which we can see one up close on the next slide. Um, and the point is about these that they indicate indicate a certain situation, a certain idea. Um, but the point is that once again, they have this, this quality that is unsophisticated because it is unfired. And so it go, takes out a whole process of the, what a kind of a normal ceramicist would, would consider. Um, if we go on to the next slide, please. Um, and then we come to my own work here and this, is a piece I made um, a few years ago at Morley, and in fact, this is on uh, the wall. This was on the wall in the Morley Ceramic Studio, um, and this contains um, bits of rather broken up porcelain tile, some of which are glazed. Um, the wire that it, that the little flowers are on—you could call them flowers. Uh, had been used in the kiln room at, uh, in the kilns at the Morley, and I drew on the wall. Um, and then, if you see the next slide, please. Um, so this is a little bit further back. Um, and the board that everything is sitting on is one of the boards that the potters use um, daily. There are um, so it's uh, you can see the quality of it is is not it's not new. It's been used over and over again. And then the photograph that's masking taped onto the wall is the is a photograph of the drawing that I'd done that I had done. Um, so the last slide, I think. Um, so this is, I mean, you could call it a scene. You can call it what you what you want, really. I'm not not really um, very concerned about how people regard it, but it's made up of discarded bits and pieces, and everything that is there has been used again. Um, and I've still, and the work I'm doing at the moment continues to use pieces I've used over and over again. Um, so I suppose you could say it's recycled art. And now we're passing on to Yoka. Um, I looked into uh, different ways how ceramic work could be finished in a more sustainable way. If something's made out of clay, um, the work gets fired twice and uh, the first firing goes to about a thousand degrees and it hardens the work. And then there's a second firing where the work gets covered in a glaze, really for functionality or embellishment. And it gets fired to uh, about 1100 degrees if it's earthenware clay and about 1260 when it's a stoneware clay. Um, I looked at different artists who cut out one of the firings and fired just once. And then I also looked at different ways of how you could cut out one of these firings. So if we can have um, the next slide, please. Thank you. Uh, this is work that is made by Yoon Shiok Hayon. He's a Korean artist. He's based in the Netherlands and he studied at the Design Academy in Eindhoven. And this is an educational academy that is really focused on the urgency of uh, reforming social structures and systems. Yoon Shiok Hayon uses Ot, and ot is a traditional resin from lacquer trees. These trees are native in Korea and China and Japan. And it's um, 
traditional lacquering material called hot chill that dries out when it's applied to the pots. Um, now, the advantages are that the work only needs to be fired once uh, and also that it's very easy to recycle the work. If you want to recycle it, you can put the work back in the kiln, reheat it, and then this glaze, this resin, evaporates, which makes it um, raw clay again. We're clean, we're back to clean earth. This lacquer has been used since the third century before Christ and was. Uh, initially used for utensils and weapons and jewellery, and then it went out of fashion a bit and was mainly used as a furniture polish. And in the 50s, it was rediscovered. It dries very hard and it's, it's waterproof. Can we have the next slide, please? Thank you. This is Park Sung Yo, another Korean artist, and he uses this hot chill technique where the lacquer is filtered and refined and he then puts it over clay molds it builds up different layers and it again it um, dries it's very very hard and when he's finished he will take the clay mold away uh, revealing these lovely forms both these artists are quite secretive about uh, the intricacies of how they use this technique. Um, uh, personally, I think that's a little unfortunate because especially moving forward in a way that we hope is more sustainable and benefits everybody, I think it's, it's a very good idea to sort of share um, what we find out. Um, uh, the next slide, please. So this is an Akoma pot and um, originally ceramics in Egypt and Africa and South America were fired only once um, and uh, they were made with a slightly different method which would give them this shine so it wasn't necessary to put them through a second firing. These Acoma pots originate in southwestern New Mexico. And with this method, the finished pot, when it's still leather hard, so it's not completely dry, and before it's fired, is covered with a very thin layer of clay, uh, kaolin. It's a soft, white clay. And this clay is gathered and prepared by using powdered rock and also remnants of broken pottery. So it's put on the pot, this sort of slip, this liquid clay, and then it's, it's um, polished by using a stone so it becomes very, very shiny and it gives the pot a lovely sheen. So the next slide, please. Firing pots for a second time uh, was introduced quite late in the 17th century. Originally, um, Pots were fired once, but when different oxides and metals were discovered and used, it needed a second firing for these colours to really be um, part of the pot. And so the work that we know is as Majolica or Delft ware, um, tin glazed pottery, started using this second firing. Um, Another sort of disadvantage of firing work twice is that it's very hard to recycle it because the work is fused with this glass base on it. So there's sort of particles of glass attached to the, to the clay. So it uh, doesn't go back to raw earth. Uh, next slide, please. This is um, a jug made by Stephen Hill, and he uses a method called raw glazing, where the work is only fired once. He puts on the glaze when the pot is um, nearly dry or leather hard, and then fires it once. This is quite a sort of risky business because um, the pot, when it's made and when it's dry but not fired, will absorb water in the glaze again. And then there's an expansion and a contraction process that goes on that can cause the glaze to fall off. But um, it is possible, and different potters have used it. Most famously, Lucy Ree uh, used uh, this as a method to finish 
her work. Um, next slide, please. Um, with my own work, uh, really during the pandemic, I started looking at different ways to make things and fire things. And the first thing was really uh, done by necessity because I was running out of clay and supplies and it wasn't very easy to get hold of things. So I started making smaller and smaller things to make my supplies last. And these little tiles are only two and a half by two and a half centimeter. Um, my work originally is, is stoneware based, functional stoneware work, but I started looking at doing things with earthenware, earthenware clay, so I could fire to a, to a lower temperature as well. So um, I'm just sort of looking different ways to work myself that just reduce my footprint a little bit. Um, Thank you, and I'm going to hand over to Debbie now. Hi, hi everyone. Um, I'm going to talk about two ceramicists who have incorporated waste materials in their ceramic making practices. And then at the end of my little talk, I'll speak about what I've been doing here in my studio. So um, these two ceramicists that I'm going to talk about have both been really innovative in their approaches and have helped to create awareness of environmental sustainability within the ceramic industry and beyond and they have contributed towards creating a more circular economy. So first of all we're going to talk about Agne Korcherenke whose work you see here in front of you and um, her work is called Ignorance of Bliss this ignorance is bliss. It's her body of work created by taking industrial metal waste and turning it into fine powders and using this to create dyes um, either in the clay body or for the glazes. So Korturenke collected raw materials from industrial facilities such as soil remediation plants, water purification centers, and some zinc factories. So for example, uh, when you remediate soil, there's a huge process that um, is undertaken. And in, at the end, there's around about 30,200 tons of metal waste that's generated per year from one of these uh, purification plants. And when we talk about water treatment, this is for potable water. You can have up to 10 tons of iron sludge that's generated uh, in the process of purifying water. So Kortorenke discovered that you can take this metal waste and you can refine it and incorporate it into the ceramic process. Normally the sludge would be either contained in purpose-built landfill sites or put into metal containers um, because it's highly toxic and cannot be left to leach out or run into the groundwater around these um, facilities. So cut a long story short, in these processes, there's a high concentration of iron, manganese, aluminium, magnesium, barium and zinc. And Kortorenke, when she takes the sludge, she puts it through her own process of drying it, milling it, and sieving it, and finally resulting in a really fine pigment, which is essentially the ground down um, waste that she's collected. So if we can have the next slide, please. Yeah, you can see a selection of her tiles and also on the left-hand side, you can see some ground down um, oxide that was taken from this metal waste sludge. And she's created these um, range of tiles. So if she used just 10% of the waste pigment, it resulted in a, um, a greeny tone, which you can see there, pale green. If she used up to 20%, it would create more of a brownish hue. So there's some variation and it's not an exact science because it's highly dependent on how much of one of these metals are within the, the sludge that she's collecting. So traditionally oxides are mind. They come from far off places and um, there's a lot of ecological cost to it, human cost. 
and um, transportation costs. So through her, her process, she's trying to close the loop and rather use waste products, as I say, into the ceramic process. Okay, next slide, please. So now we're gonna talk about Lottie Daus. She's from the Netherlands. And her concern, similar to um, Agne Korcherenke and also the Granby folk that Sue mentioned earlier, is the waste that's generated in the process of creating fine porcelain. She was concerned about this and went on a whole research program to Shenzhen in China. And ha as a result has created a new way of creating porcelain but at the same time, retaining its translucency and its whiteness, which are two critical characteristics of porcelain that all of us potters who work with it love it for. So the um, kaolin is one of the main uh, raw materials that is used in the process of creating porcelain. And it's highly industrialized, the mining of this um, not only happens in China, but as Annette mentioned earlier, you can find it down in Cornwall. You can find it in South Africa. There's huge kaolin mines around Cape Town in South Africa. And over the years, this has caused ecological problems around the mines. And what has also been found and was of concern to Lottie um, Dowers is that the, poor, the kaolin is reducing in its quality. So the porcelain that's ultimately created, fine pieces, are not as translucent and not as white. So she went to Shinkansen and she found huge mountains of discarded um, porcelain that has um, been discarded due to imperfections in the ceramic pieces. So she's collected this and she's ground it down and she's reincorporated into her ceramic tableware. So here you can see in the slides, she's created this range of tableware that vary in color and in texture. It's called Shadows of Light. And she has managed to create in her own studio. She brought all, back all her research and she's created what she terms perpetual porcelain. So she takes the waste within her one production cycle and she continues to bring that waste back into the same production cycle. So she'll start out with a generating a cup of a particular color, then the waste generated from that, she'll incorporate it into the next cup in the same production cycle, as I mentioned. So this is her body of work. And if we turn to the next slide, you get a closer look at the translucency that she's able to retain in her porcelain pieces here on the left. And on the right, you can see how the ground down materials um, look like before they're incorporated into the cups below that. So the whole process um, can generate quite a lot of waste and she still manages to gather the last little bits together and create little coasters for cups and so on. Uh, so the next slide, please. So coming back to me, during the lockdown period, I was experimenting with using rust. And this came about because our garden had just been completed, a re-landscaping program. And I had put in a lot of cortain steel around the garden, which is a type of metal, it's steel. It's a combination of steel alloys that are placed together and it creates this um, naturally weathering metal, which you'll probably see in architectural structures um, around the UK. And I noticed that in the first few months, the core 10 goes through a process of natural weathering and it almost creates an outer skin, which then becomes corrosion resistant, which is one of the great things about Corten, and it retains its strength. But in the initial phases, it starts to sort of create these flakes of rust, which I collected. And I wanted to see if this would react in the same way as iron oxide we use in the 
um, pottery studio at Morley. And yes, yeah, so I gathered the, the flakes, I ground them down, which you see in the middle picture. Then I incorporated it with water and I let it sit for a while so it would mature and um, sort of blend together well. So I can have the next slide, please. I then painted it onto a little porcelain disc in varying levels of thickness. And um, then I fired it with a little bit of clear glaze over the top, which you can see just on either side there. And um, I was quite pleased, it's a successful result. So I'm hoping I can use this um, going forward in my projects. So really what I'm aiming at is to use the iron oxide on my own site here. I've also dug up clay from my property, which I'll be using um, in some pieces uh, in the future. And I've been burning wood in my wood stove and I'll be collecting the ash from that to create glazes. So trying to keep it all very local to my, um, to my property. So there's no transport costs, everything's here and available. And um, yeah, we'll see what happens in the future. And back to Annette. Thank you, um, everyone. It's really interesting. I think lockdown has been quite useful, actually, hasn't it, as far as sustainability is concerned? Um, yeah, some lots of food for thought, I think, there. Uh, so I sort of prepared a, a question. I mean, I'm sure we could um, be asking one another questions for ages because there's so much to think about. But um, I just thought I'd ask Sue something. Uh, so there seems to be a strong thread of collaboration running through some of the design as the makers highlighted in, in the whole of the slideshow, actually. But um, do you think you could elaborate more on the collective nature of the origins and practice of Granby Workshop? Yeah, um, it, it, it's one of many projects that Assemble have undertaken. Um, and it's Assemble who are the collective who won the Turner Prize. And they are architects and designers and makers. Um, their big themes really are collaboration and cro a cross-discipline collaboration, but also to do with everyday objects and the importance of how everyday objects are made um, at a variety of scales, which is why you they're Turner Price thing is effectively some houses, um, <clears throat> but they're also just making tiles um, and and much smaller things. They they also do have done collaborations with other third parties. So, um, for example, they did a collaboration with Armitage Shanks um, to commemorate or mark the hundredth anniversary of Armitage Shanks, which also. Uh, coincided with the 100th anniversary of the the uh, Duchamp Fountain piece. And what they did with Armitage Shanks was they made a toilet um, using kind of marbling techniques. So it's a full-size toilet that they've made by hand from coloured clay with Armitage Shanks. Um, and they, there's another collaboration, which is a, a well-known ceramic one, which they did with art on the underground and an artist called Matthew Raw at Seven Sisters Tube Station, um, where they refurbished a, a kiosk um, outside the station. And they drew on that whole ceramic um, heritage of, of London Underground. And they did, it, did this whole thing with over a thousand handmade tiles. Um, and in doing that as well, they pulled in a couple of apprentices through the Create Job Jobs training program. So there's a whole collaborative and kind of democratic cooperative thing going on cross-discipline. Yeah, I think it relies on that as well, doesn't it? Even, you know, from getting their waste from factories and then mm. working with communities. Um, and it's interesting, isn't it, how you, you're getting designers who aren't necessarily ceramicists mm. looking at the idea, you know, starting with the idea of sustainability and then actually working mm. with pharmacists. So. Mm. And it's it's yeah. nice as well, that that focus on the everyday objects yeah. um, because so much of art that 
we see um, moves away from the everyday object mm. and that focus on the everyday, particularly in something that like the Turner Prize that so often um, leaves a lot of people's everyday life behind, really, um, is yeah. actually really nice to see. Mm. Mm. I've, I've got a question for Yoka. Yoka, if I, can I ask you something about one of your... Yeah. What, what you actually mentioned when we looked at your Stephen... Um, Hill picture slide. You you talked about expansion and contraction when you um, when you glaze um, an unfired clay object because of the the in, inherent instability in it. Um, it is re- it's a really interesting idea halving the firing by just doing it once. Mm. But in your research of and uh, your experience, have you picked up any other technical things? Technical problems or techniques that you might have to be adopted to just ensure some success if you're going to Mm. have have that second firing? Well, I I think, first of all, in order to have success, what I've sort of gathered from researching this a bit is that you need to do lots of testing because it seems fraught uh, with difficulties. Um, so there's different ways to sort of glaze the work. I mean, the difficulty is, is this contraction and expansion. You know, when we fire uh, our work twice and we put the glaze on the hardened clay, it's already hardened and then it can, the glass sort of can fuse or with a lower firing, have a layer on top over the clay. But if the clay hasn't been fired and you put a glaze on that has water in it, it will rehydrate the clay. And so the clay expands. And then when it dries out, it contracts. And this can make this glaze uh, flake off. And there are different ways to tackle it. One is that there's uh, quite a high clay content in the glaze, uh, usually between 5 and 10%, and there's also bentonite in it. Um, so this will help to sort of adhere more to the finished piece. And then in terms of glazing it, that people do different things. Um, Stephen Hill says, you know, you could glaze the... Um, interior when the glaze is leather when the clay is leather hard and the exterior when the piece is bone dry uh, but there is less room for error when you put the glaze on when the work is is leather hard you know there's not there's less room for error because of the uh, shock in the kiln when you put the work in and another drawback is, is that when you have an initial bisque firing, a lot of the impurities have come out of the clay. And because this now becomes part of this process, uh, impurities and moisture can leave the clay and that can bubble the glaze. So you can have, um, uh, in, you know, sort of faults in your glaze in that, that way. Um, in terms of how to put uh, the glaze on, it sounds like the less water or the less uh, thickness you put on would be better. So he says you can do a first dip, and then if you want multiple layers, you spray rather than keep dipping it, which would be a recipe for a disaster. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I found out that actually Lucy Ree, she would brush the glazes on, and she didn't understand why not more people did that, because she found that in terms of the creative process, created lots of possibilities for her to decorate her pot. So she really used it for her advantage. Um, so... Uh, I think it would be wonderful if you could do it. And I think it opens up lots of possibilities. It's harder if you want really shiny work because uh, shiny glazes Mm -hmm. don't have as much clay content. So if you are happy with a slightly more matter um, finish, then it would be good. Uh, And in terms of firing, uh, again, Stephen Hill says he fires initially very slowly to a thousand degrees uh, to get rid of these impurities. And then he he will take his work up to stoneware, even to, you know, 2232 or 2270. Um, So he fires quite high. And I think what I found very interesting is that 
for him, it becomes very much part of the whole process because he said making something out of clay is quite stop start. You know, you make it, you fire it once, you put something else on, you fire it again. So the raw glazing gives him a sense of fluidity to finishing his work. Um, and I thought, yeah, that was a very interesting take on it as well. Mm. It does sound as though it, it potentially becomes a bit more sort of time critical because you're going to have to do your glazing at quite specific points. You, you, you yeah. can see it becoming much more, yeah, as you say, much less stop, start, walk away and come back and... I imagine you have to sort of monitor the clay and uh, and I mm. can also see that it can vary in the summer and in the winter, you know, mm. <laughs> how quickly your sort of clay dries. Um, mm. So, but, but quite exciting as well, mm. I imagine, when you figure mm. it out and it, and it works. You know? Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Um, I would like to ask Arabella something. Uh, Arabella, the, the, the people you highlighted and also your own work, um, it's sort of using unfired clay and unfired clay is, is fragile in nature. And I wondered if you see this as part of the work of art or the intention of the artist, you know, taking into account that uh, we all have said a benefit from fired clay is that it will last for centuries um good question yes um i think i uh, from from what i make myself and the kind of things i enjoy um it, it sort of goes against the grain um when using clay because as annette started with the talk earlier that the, the longevity is one of the fabulous things about it. Um, but I, I'm very interested um, in the kind of things that actually don't last. Um, <laughs> and as with my own work, I reuse, as I said. Um, but also if you have um, uh, kind of art materials, and it's, this is less, less uh, the case with functional pottery, obviously, um, um, that, that they can disappear. And if you have, you think about the concepts of people who make land art and people who make, um, someone like Anya Galaccio who makes art out of flowers. So they, there's, a, there's a change in the nature of the art um, um, and, and sometimes it might disappear. So uh, for example, uh, Spiral Jetty by Robert Smithson, um, he built things in the sea. Um, and then they they went away again. And I think I think it's quite an interesting interesting idea um, that it doesn't have to last. Um, mm. uh, but other things, other ways of looking at it, uh, looking at the use of clay, is quite the opposite. So perhaps it shows us that it's just completely different. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> but, um, um, I don't know if that's an answer, but but it's the kind of thing that interests me a lot, and the fact that. The fact that the work I've made over the last few years um, doesn't exist anymore, I quite like. Mm. And they, they come off the wall or, you know, I had to repaint the pottery studio um, and they're in plastic boxes in a wardrobe. Um, I think that's... It, that's it, it did exist for just a period of time, you know. Yeah, mm. yeah. It's, mm. it's, it's, it's left its trace. Yes, yes, mm. yes exactly. Mm. Um, Debbie, I've got something for you. Um, and you, you're talking about your your local materials, and actually we live quite close to each other. Mm -hmm. So, um, mm -hmm. and you you've you've th talked about a cycle, I think, where you have you've got you've sourced something, you've made something, you've finished it, and then you're in a way it's going back. Um, mm -hmm. um, and I think you're probably at the beginning of this working out what you're going to do with these mm -hmm. things. Um, but I was wondering about if you could do into a change or make a development in terms of scale and volume or perhaps that's not relevant or, or um, you know lots of us try and make you know perfect things and make them over and over again and the more you make a cake the better it gets but but I don't know if that's even something that you you're interested in I, I wondered what you thought well yeah as you say it is I'm in the initial stages of it and there's quite a lot for me to get my head around and understand with the with the clay um, to start with that I've got from my property here is essentially earthenware clay, which goes to a lower temperature than stoneware. I mainly work in stoneware, so I'm going to have to adjust things to 
but that's not a problem really. It's just a temperature sort of programming of the kiln. It's really understanding at what temperature this particular earthenware clay becomes vitrified. That's when it's no longer porous and you can keep liquids in it without it seeping out. And my initial tests with um, the clay here is I took it to normal earthenware temperature. I actually tested it at Morley and Alex, a technician, helped me out with that. But um, once glazed and I brought it home and I put water in the little vase and flowers, the water started seeping out. <laughs> there was this little pool around it. And I was like, uh-huh. So I went back to Alex and we were talking about it. I think it needs to go to a higher temperature. But because it's not a clay that I've bought from a pottery supply place where these temperatures are very much tested and known, yeah, I, I need to do that on my own. So I need to do quite a lot of that testing to figure out when it's right. Um, with the iron oxide and that, I think the test that I showed you was successful and I could probably just go ahead with that now. So I'm not too worried about that. Doing that at scale though, is more of a challenge because as I was saying, the Corten steel heals itself in a sense, and it's not a, a metal that corrodes, which then like, you know, when you see these old, um, metal barrels where they all they've got holes in you know it actually looks like the rust is eaten into it Corten doesn't do that it self heals and then it's no longer going to be flaking off for me to get that um, iron oxide off it but I'm in contact with a garden designer and the people who did all the hard landscaping and they have access to Corten all around North London so I could get them involved, which would be quite fun. Mm -hmm. um, they've actually been involved with, because they got me some metal strapping to make that, you know, when you get bricks and you get that strapping that mm -hmm. comes around, I got them to go around and get me some of that from their site so I could make tools. <laughs> <laughs> so I've already involved them so they won't think I'm too crazy. And then, um, yeah, so upscaling the clay, there's a lot of building work around North London as you, you know, around the whole of London. And this particular area where I am is where the Romans settled, you know, in Roman times, and they created a lot of useful um, earthenware from tableware to all kinds of storage containers. Then this area shifted into brick making, which is a big um, area for that. Mm -hmm. And you can see in the walls of some of the properties around here, all the old bricks that were part of the kilns where they fired the, the bricks. And these outer sort of bricks in the kiln, they used to degrade. So instead of, this is actually a good example of recycling, instead of just completely discarding this in waste heaps, it got incorporated into garden walls all around here, which is amazing to go and see. Um, and I think for me, once I realized that, it's made these walls so much more beautiful. They've got a history and they have been, it's waste being reused, which is fantastic. So there's a lot of clay up here and I have seen it in many skips all around. You know, when people are digging up for garden work, for renovations, a um, few people are putting in basements, which is a bit of a concern because of the hydrology, but. That aside, there's a lot of clay coming up. So I could go and get more. So if you talk about scaling up or involving other potters in the area, that is something I could do for sure. Yeah, so. You get a dome mixer. Pardon? You yeah. just need to get a dome mixer. <laughs> it's going to be a lot of work. <laughs> I need a dome mixer because I'm sitting now with a few bags of the clay from here and it's quite a lot of work to process it. You know, you have a real respect yeah. for for people that are um, using wild clay because there's a lot of um, steps in the process and to get it right and purified enough to work with it. So, yeah, I probably need some some kind of machinery if I'm going to upscale this. Yeah. yeah. Does that answer the question, Arabella? It does. It does. And if you get other people involved, when you won't have to go and raid other people's skips and gardens in the middle of the night. So that will be... <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, actually, I had a question coming back to you, Annette. 
that's okay. Yeah. Um, I think, you know, you're the head of the ceramics department, which I guess puts you in a unique position to create change if it's needed within the ceramic studio and how it functions, both in terms of how the students use materials and how the tutors are working with the students. Um, so I guess it's kind of a point of looking at how how Morley educates students coming through in sustainability in in the use of clay and all the materials involved. And I wondered if you had any ideas of how you could take that forward or anything you're exploring currently with um, your department. Yeah, I mean, that's a great question, actually, because it's a question I took to the tutors last week um, because we had a, a section meeting. Um, and that was, I, I wanted them to bring one thing that they felt that we could do better as far as sustainability is in the department. Um, and it was a really good meeting because of that. You know, we all got, got very involved in the whole, because uh, I think we do do things quite well in the department. We recycle all our clay. We make a, a sort of general purpose body out of some of our clays. We, we make um, a porcelain slip out of our porcelain scraps. But... Um, we, in fact, I've got a bit of a list here, but there were quite a few things that um, we we started to think that we really ought to kind of highlight more and just sort of take our time and and try and taking some small steps, but actually just gradually introducing these ideas. So um, we started with looking at selecting work for firing uh, rather than firing absolutely everything that mm -hmm. people make. Um, just embed them to do a selection process so that they're not firing every single little wobbly, you know, if they're, they're throwing on the wheel, they can mm -hmm. choose choose their better pieces for firing. Um, testing glazes, so whenever anything's being made, and this is right from the beginner level, to make some small tests out of clay that they can then practice their glazing on and rather than you know allowing students to multiple fire work mm -hmm. so that they get the right surface so I mean that's good practice anyway I think right from the beginning um, another thing consideration was to build um, awareness of the cost of materials mm. actually because some materials are incredibly expensive so um and I think at first, in particular, you know, it's, uh, the department's a bit like a sweet shop. You look at all those fantastic glaze tests. And, but to have some awareness of how not just the financial, but the material costs of things. Um, uh, we looked at not being wasteful with material, to um, be much more conscious of recycling as you go on, rather than leaving it to dry out. And, not be used. Um, one thing that we are all beginning to do actually is devise um, and plan projects that will encourage students to think more about their own practice right from the beginning and, and how they can make, alter their way of working actually to just change it slightly so that they're looking right from the beginning. Um, just sort of looking more with inquiry and thoughtfulness about 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 what they're doing um i think i mean one of the things that i said that i think is most important is to actually involve the students in the idea of sustainability right from the beginning so to actually have rather than imposing all of these things that you can and can't do to actually have a discussion mm where students will come up with suggestions themselves. And, um, you know, that's often the best way to make some gradual changes in the, in the mm. department, I think. Now that makes a lot of sense to me, actually, because I think sometimes people feel really preached to, especially on sustainability issues, yeah. and involving people in, in problem solving it can allow people to feel more of a, a sense of ownership and they buy into the whole thing 
a lot, you know, more readily. Yeah. And if you just tell them what to do. And actually, also, if you've had time to think about how this works in your practice in, a, in ceramics, you start, it starts like a ripple effect into how you use materials in your day to day. Yeah. I think it's, I mean, actually, to conclude, because I think we're sort of nearing the end of our time, but I mean, I just think it's incumbent on us now as makers and educators to take this subject seriously. Um, we have to embed sustainability, and I just don't think it can be ignored anymore. Um, so, you know, and I think that's uh, what you've been doing and the research that you've been doing and how you've been looking at this in your own practice is mm. it's a start, isn't it? And um, I think it's it's just something that can be reviewed and revisited continuously from now on. Yeah. So thank you, everyone. Um, and thank I want to thank Emily and Stephanie and Camilla who are in the background helping with that with this. but especially you for, um, you know, you've brought some fantastic ideas and thought into this presentation. So thank you very much.